name is Jeremiah Vest. I am the agriculture educator, and we have Ms. Sarah Peavy, who is working our technical side today. And with us, um, we have Ms. Sandra Bureau from Indian Lake School District. Uh, one of the things that we offer at New York Ag Agriculture in the Classroom is an agricultural literacy grant, and that's a chance for teachers to apply um, to extend agricultural education with their cross-curricular um, next generation learning standards. And we want to support teachers with that resource. And Ms. Sandra Bureau is one of our 2020 grant recipients. So Ms. Bureau, Sandra, can you tell us about yourself? And I know you live in the Adirondacks, which is very near and dear to my heart because I think I could throw a rock and hit your school district from our school district. We're both in the heart deep dark heart of the Adirondacks, which is very dear to me. What does it mean to you living in the Adirondacks? What is it like? Everybody vacations up here, but what is it like being a teacher in the Adirondacks? Well, it really is a beautiful place, but there's so many things that people don't think about, like how long it takes to get to the grocery store or the doctor or a hospital. And that teaching here you have to remember too that it's a really small school it's a micro school lots of schools in the adirondacks are really tiny and so that means our kids are involved in all kinds of activities especially sports and during the summer season they'll be working so they're not always available all the time for a whole bunch of different things so usually stuff. If you want things to get done, you got to sort of get it incorporated into the classroom. So what is the Indian Lake community like? Um, you mentioned a, a smaller community. Um, Population-wise, how many people are in Indi Indian Lake year-round? And does that change through the different seasons? Oh, yeah. I think there's about 1,500 full-time residents in Indian Lake proper. It also includes Blue Mountain Lake and another area called Sabeel. Um, but then that population explodes during the winter, be, or excuse me, during the summer, because they have, um, there's a lot of second home owners. And so it might be relatively quiet throughout the um, fall and the spring and the winter. It's really um, busy. Uh, during the summer. After Memorial Day, it really gets going. So you're in the heart of the Adirondacks. We think of the Adirondacks as a beautiful summer place, beautiful fall foliage. Um, but other than that, we have our snowmobile season. <laughs> yeah. And we think of the three million acres of um, state land and three million acres of private land. What is agriculture like in the Adirondacks? Well, <laughs> it's, um, if you want to count forestry, then we would be all set. But for agriculture otherwise, especially in the central Adirondacks where I'm located, um, the only kind of agriculture probably is your home garden. And a person that might have some, a few chickens or cows, you know, there's no large scale um, agriculture happening in the central part of the Adirondacks. Um, so when it comes to um, getting food from local sources, it's not really local unless you grow it yourself. So I know here um, in Inlet where, where I live, uh, we're a zone three, um, just like Indian Lake which if people don't know, that's a hardiness zone that tells you how long our seasons um, last. Uh, zone three is pretty cold, um, where other places in state can be four, five, six, and even seven as you head downstate. Um, so we have a tough time growing things um, locally. And I've heard this uh, term food desert thrown around. Can you, are you aware of this term? And, if you are, can you describe what a food desert is? Yeah, um, a food desert is an area where there it's you're not able to either grow or pro procure um, food for your for yourself. It means food is for the most part, you know, fresh produce in particular um, is trucked in, and that would be a pretty good example 
uh, for most of my students and families in Indian Lake. Um, there's a few of us gardeners, but for the most part, people have to go to a grocery store. Uh, we do have a vibrant farmer's market, but that's only during the summer season. Otherwise, people have to travel um, a distance um, to get uh, a variety, a large variety of fresh food um, that people are used to. So from what you're telling us, I, I have a feeling that your students do not have much of a, a knowledge of agriculture. Um, so <laughs> here you are, you're an Ag Literacy Grant recipient. What, what are you hoping to be able to conquer? Um, what are you hoping to teach and impart in your students as far as agriculture in the classroom? Well, a couple of things. We do have a school garden, um, which has been maintained for a number of years by a wonderful um, teaching assistant, Elsa Schisler, but she just retired. And she has um, built a group of elementary students who have spent time in the garden. Um, but I wanted to carry that garden tradition making, growing our own food for the cafeteria, giving them some experience on how, how easy it actually is to garden for yourself and how you can garden here in the Adirondacks. And then also to introduce the idea of, um, of how to prepare for climate change. The climate's gonna change our gardens and our abilities to get food will probably change in the future. And I want them to have a skill set that will allow them to have the opportunity to grow their own food and be able to um, uh, be resilient with changes that will happen in the future. And I love that answer. Um, it supports <laughs> our mission. And that's one of the reasons why you were awarded the grant. It's because our focus here at New York Agriculture in the Classroom is to help students, teachers, communities, organizations understand the food, food and fiber networks and the opportunities uh, career-wise, but also to understand what is needed going forward. So as you are developing this space, what does your garden look like now? We're in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> Have you all been able to continue um, your work in the garden um, or has it gone faro for a year and maybe given the chance to uh, recuperate. What, what's going on in the Indian Lake School Garden? Well, we haven't been able to, um, well, I'll back up a little bit because we had planned in my seventh grade life science um, this past year, we started growing some of the plants because you've got to start from seed up here and you got to start indoors and so we started growing some of those plants before we left in march and so i took all of those things home and then i would um we had a couple of ex experiments going on and i would measure um, measure the plants, take pictures of the plants as they were going along. Um, unfortunately, the kids could not help me when I went to plant things in the garden, but right now the garden is, is beautiful. We've, it's flowering for all the pollinators. We've been taking zucchini out of the garden, which we give to our school cafeteria manager, and she's uh, shredding it and freezing it to make into zucchini muffins throughout the school year. Um, yeah, everything, oh my gosh, our cherry tomatoes are going like gangbusters. Oh yeah, the garden is, uh, the garden is looking good because of a couple of volunteers, adults that we can, we can go in and we can work on it. Well, it sounds like I need to take a quick drive to have an ice cream <laughs> and check out the garden. I'm very excited. Yeah, Might be a few tomatoes missing and maybe a zucchini or two. So yeah. that yeah. is incredible that you, it sounds like you have great support in the community. Can you describe to us what is the community support that you have in Indian Lake? Well, I think right at, for the most part, we have a lot of um, internal school support amongst teachers and students. Um, we do have a very active um, Indian Lake Garden Club and they have not been as much involved, which I would hope that we can going um, uh, fo uh, forward. 
Um, parents certainly have been excited about what we do in the community garden, um, as well as the school staff and of course the students. Well, I have to give a shout out to custodial staff. Um, oh, yeah. I'm sure you can also, uh, when I was teaching and in the classroom, we had projects throughout the year and my all-stars were the custodial staff. They were the backbone. Is that the same thing in Indian Lake? Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. In fact, I'm really lucky in that the custodian closet is right across from my door and our custodian there, Matt Spring, he is a fellow gardener. And so we are always talking about gardening and food and uh, yeah, he's really excited about my hydroponic system that's coming for the winter. So before we go into your hydroponics, a little word of advice for those teachers who are, are looking into getting into this agricultural pedagogy, find out your custodian's favorite sweet dessert <laughs> and treat them. They will treat you well and support you. They're some of the biggest supporters and often never seen, but always around when needed. So you applied for a grant you know, with New York Ag in the Classroom and it was for a hydroponics. So how are you, what is your plans for this um, new endeavor that you're taking on at uh, Indian Lake? Well, I think like most teachers, we all have probably had to change our plans a little bit over the summer. And originally I had hoped to work with my seventh grade life science class. Um, but this year, uh, because of scheduling and how we're gonna have the kids in the classroom, I won't be teaching seventh grade life science. We won't have it in, at all, in fact. Um, and so I've been working over the past couple of weeks looking at how am I gonna use the hydroponic system in my living environment class and also with my college chemistry class. And I've definitely already found a great unit on um, the Ag in the Classroom lesson plans on solutions, concentration, parts per million for nutrients. So I think we'll be doing that unit um, as a way to learn about um, and pH. Um, and then for living environment, I'm still toying with, um, obviously it's perfect for doing any kind of controlled experimentation. So we can modify light, we could modify nutrients and then look at photosynthesis rates and growth rate. Um, but I'd also like to look at, um, again, climate change is one of the things that um, is part of the living environment curriculum in New York State. So um, I think I'm gonna try something that manipulates the hydroponic system to represent um, maybe changes in climate conditions. So it sounds like we're definitely gonna to have to touch back with you through the year and see how you're incorporating <laughs> oh, awesome. this hydroponics so that we can share it back out. Um, so how are, are you seeing a agricultural fit inside your um, pedagogy as a teacher? Is it supporting the cross curricular content and the standards? Um, oh, how do yeah. you feel about agriculture? Oh, oh, oh definitely. Um, I, we have new New York State Science Learning Standards based on next generation science learning standards and the Ag in the Classroom lesson plans um, will fit. We, I can massage those um, to um, fit the next generation science standard um, uh, delivery, so to speak. So I don't see, I, I don't see a problem with that. I think it's like with most teachers, you, it, you might have an area that you have passion about and you can find a connection for everything. So for many years, because I have over 30 years experience in the classroom, uh, I and my degrees in forestry. So, you know, ecology and trees and that, that was a, a big uh, focus for me. But when I started paying more attention to climate change, and how our students don't know anything about where their food comes from and how to grow it for themselves. Um, I started to shift my focus and yeah, there's just lots of connections um, everywhere in the science curriculum. 
So we have a food desert. You have students that um, don't have an agricultural background. You have climate change. And now you have a history of elementary students that are participating in agriculture. Are you seeing personal growth or are you seeing any character development in your students as they participate with agriculture in the classroom? Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, my seventh graders from this past year, um, they were one of the first groups that had come through the elementary with the, the gardening club and using the school garden. And they were, uh, they, uh, yeah, they're just really caring, curious, inquisitive um, individuals. They loved being outside um, in the garden and doing things and helping things and giving their, it was the biggest thing in uh, last September was to go out to the school garden and we'd find some you know, a uh, stray zucchini or some leftover tomatoes or a couple of onions and then bringing them into the school cafeteria that would in turn be shared for everybody else. They just, they just loved it. It, it, it just developed such a good uh, social emotional um, milieu when you can um, work outside in the garden and grow your own food. It's just, yeah, it's, it's something else. So, how, how are, are students starting to identify how some of these standards and things they are, are learning um, happen or take place in the real world? Um, are they having those opportunities through participating? Um, say, you're talking about pH, you know, I may have a lesson on pH, and now you have the space where they can participate with pH. Are you seeing a benefit in that with your students? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, because their conversations and when they talk about stuff in the garden and the learning that we've done in the classroom, um, they're much more um, conversant and intelligent about their own um, conversations. Yeah, I, I see that it's not disconnected from each other, that they're able to put this all together. Well, and I know with the Next Generation Standards, that's, that's definitely um, one of the aspects of phenomena learning and, and inquiry-based learning, which is awesome um, that you're seeing that in your district. I wanna back up for a minute here. You've sure. mentioned cafeteria multiple times. It sounds like you have another great resource there. Yes. Can you describe what goes on in your cafeteria between your classroom and cafeteria? Well, um, our, well, we have, a, we have a great staff in the cafeteria. They do a lot of home cooked meals. And over the years, since we've had the school garden, they have done a great job of using materials from the school garden in, um, in cafeteria food. So when we have extra stuff in the fall, she'll freeze it or prepare it some way to use throughout the rest of the, um, the school year. That's awesome. Are, are you all able to use it in any other, like life science or any other cooking situations? Oh, um, so here the, the dark underbelly of small schools is going to come out because we don't have um, a home and careers teacher anymore. Um, and we, our cooking program has gotten a lot smaller. We're just doing the bare minimum that New York State requires right now for um, middle school. But I do a lot of cooking, um, especially food science in my uh, college chemistry class. Well, I was about to say, it sounds like the perfect place for uh, college chemistry yeah. Um, and, and definitely the physics behind, you know, cooking things and how heat yep. and, and how it changes things. Um, so do you have um, any other teachers that support your program? Do you have a movement uh, with inside the Indian Lake uh, community, uh, school community that supports you in your work? Well, there's certainly there's lots of teachers and administrators, the janitor staff, the cafeteria staff, they're all interested 
and willing to help um, in the garden. Um, the janitorial staff, they help by mowing, um, and the cafeteria staff, obviously, by taking um, our produce and making it into something else. And that's, that. likewise with the hydroponics, that's what I'm hoping is gonna happen is that our um, food from the hydroponic system, as long as we didn't do anything really weird to it, uh, would make it into, um, would make it into salads and food um, at the uh, at the cafeteria level. So facing the uncertainty uh, of this upcoming school year, um, I think a lot of districts are going to make an attempt to be in the classroom. Yep. Um, but we never know. Mm -hmm. As in March, we got the call and we went straight to virtual learning, which we, we as teachers didn't really have the time for that. Um, to develop those lessons in that platform and kudos to all my New York State teachers and teachers around the nation. Phenomenal job. You are all um, all star teachers. What are your plans um, coming up. How might you shift as a teacher to share out ideas with other teachers that might um, be joining us now or participating and watching the recorded version. How might you be able to shift um, be it if we're in the in this classroom or we go back to the virtual learning platform. Yeah, so I, I'm sort of in a fortunate situation that um, I'd probably still be able to get into the classroom. So for my hydroponic system in particular, I was already planning if I have to go um, virtual that I would still be able to be in my classroom and I can videotape lessons right from the classroom. I can, the students can still design experiments and I'll just have to be the little robot um, doing them, putting, the, putting whatever into the water or measuring the growth of the plants or you know, using some of our different probes to look at leaf square inches or yeah, or whatever. So I think that's, um, that's good or like, um, this past spring, I, I did bring my stuff home with me and um, I just set up a couple of grow lights and we were growing and I was videotaping that and um, um, measuring and posting um, to spreadsheets so the kids could manipulate the data from the experiments and then they could um, and then they would could write their claim evidence reasoning based on their <laughs> whatever they had. So that is an option. Plus, you know what, there, um, I'm just thinking about, there is so many other, uh, if people are worried about data collection, um, there's just so many other citizen science projects that are out there in the world uh, that um, if your particular project it, you know, if you can't do your particular project for any reason, there may be somebody out there who's doing something similar that is able to get out there with their class even, and you can connect with them. So getting started, um, it, it, you, you had a built-in garden um, and you're taking the next step with the hydroponics, but to the teachers who are out there who are interested in teaching through the lens of agriculture, what are some um, tips or some advice that you can give them? How, how can I get started if I don't have anything agricultural in my classroom or in my district? What are some oh, wow. tips that- Well, we'll start, start small. Um, and agriculture is about food and who cannot connect to kids about food? So, you can start with something as simple as, hey, grow some beans, do a little plant experiment, elementary all the way up through middle school, manipulate some, I'm a science teacher, so manipulate some variables um, and measure the effect on plant growth. Let the plants go and produce some beans and then eat some beans, cook some beans. Um, that, you know, just start with simple things. And um, again, if you don't have equipment in your own classroom, then ask around. The first grow light that I got was from somebody that had bought one for their grandmother and she never used it. And so we borrowed it and 
Um, and there we go. And we borrowed potting soil from some other gardener in the community and some pots and there we go. Well, just a little, um, little commercial for New York agriculture in the classroom. We do offer multiple grants, um, like the one that Sandra got. Um, we have multiple grants that uh, offer some different types of growing systems. So definitely use us as a, as a resource. I know as a teacher that I was able to go through my local community foundations and development groups. Um, and also I was able just to Google grants and found a lot of opportunity for that. Um, so wrapping up. Just uh, one note though. Yes, ma'am. Ag in the classroom grant, that was easy. There is no excuse for anyone not to be able to put something together. That was very simple to do. Awesome, I'm glad that we were able to support you. Um, before we let you go, um, do you have any great success stories um, about your students' development uh, with their participation with the agriculture or as a teacher? What, do you have that one shining moment that um, all of us teachers have that just make our chest swell up? Can you share one of those stories with us? Well, I guess um, going back to this, this past year when we were um, using our uh, school garden, um, I mean, the kids, the seventh graders every day, I, I mean, I, when we first started out, we went into the garden every single day. And on Fridays in particular, we would just sit in the garden and journal. And at the end of every single um, period, it was always like, oh my gosh, I can't believe, you know, 40 minutes is up. Can't we stay out here some more? Let's do this. Let's do that. And even through the whole uh, pandemic, the seventh graders were always going back to um, what we did in the garden. What did we learn? What did we see? What did we grow? What did we eat? That was, um, I think it was really an experience that they'll bring, well, obviously they carried through um, the whole rest of the year. And I know they're gonna be, the current seventh graders have moved up to eighth grade and I know that they're gonna be asking, is there some way we can do at something with the garden this year, but they'll, they'll they'll be doing some chemistry, a little bit of chemistry, so they'll get to do hydroponics. So they'll be excited about that. Well, I, I can mirror that as an educator. Um, when we started to involve agriculture in the classroom, my students were eager to participate. Um, we had very little uh, discipline issues. Kids yeah, were yeah. almost always on task because they knew they were about to experience something. So that is awesome. You're seeing that in Indian Lake. Uh, before we let you go, after the hydroponic, is there any other spaces that, that might be interesting to you to develop in the future? Any, any ideas for the future where you might go after the hydroponics? Oh, wow. I have always wanted to do aquaculture too. <laughs> Had the fish add fish into the um, system. I, I have to say though, I would like to get back into expanding the garden and different kinds of gardening techniques that students might be able to use and um, expanding our garden club into the middle school and perhaps the high school. Um, I, those are some areas that I'd like to work on. Well, awesome. Thank you, Sandra, on behalf of New York Agriculture in the Classroom, uh, being one of our innovative teachers in New York State and one of our Agricultural Literacy Grant recipients. Thank you, Sarah, for your support today. Uh, I'm going to have to take a, a jog up to Indian Lake and check all yeah, these definitely. things out. And we will definitely be seeing each other soon. Yep. So on behalf of New York Agriculture in the Classroom, thank you. Please tune in this Friday at 11 o'clock. We will be uh, interviewing another one of our great teachers, Molly Burgett from Middleburg. And have a great day, and we will see you all soon. Well, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Pretty painless, huh? Oh, no, that was easy. <laughs>